we're going to follow a little bit different format. Um, we're ju I'm just going to ask questions of the panel, and we've got a great panel. Um, starting off with, we'll start this in the table. Matt Comrie's from Wilbur Ellis. He's the agronomist for the North State. And then Kurt Pierce, I really want to introduce him. He's new um, for um, UC a &R. He's the irrigation advisor for the North State. Um, you just started a few months back, right? Yeah, so um, I'm really excited to have him. I'm excited that you guys all get to meet him um, because he's a critical link and a, a place where we had a void for a little while. And then Luke Milliron um, is the almond advisor for the North State. Um, both uh, both are, are local, like I am. I'm from Chico. And then Matt Angel. Matt Angel, um, he hired me once years ago. Matt Angel is a, a grower from Madeira. He's also um, part of a company called Farm Data Systems. They help growers managing data and collecting data from their fields with telemetry and technology. Um, and he falls in the category of renaissance man to me. He's got his hands into everything and has tried a lot of things. A grower that's very willing to experiment, which is great. So this topic around soils and, um, and irrigation, they really go hand in hand. And I actually, I don't know if it was a mistake or a good idea, but I shared my questions with Blake Sandin last night and, and had him look at them for, to get feedback from him. And he said, you really, you really need to start with this question first. And I kind of agree with him. This idea of, are there tips on how to overcome infiltration problems? And when, when I think of soils and irrigation, if we can't get the water to go in the ground, we're really challenged. And it's a place that, when I work with growers, it's a very common challenge for growers. But it really ties into everything we're going to talk about and the questions I'm going to pose the panel. We're going to kind of look at three areas. Um, just how soils relate to water. Then measuring. Just measurement as far as understanding your soils and measuring your soils as well as measuring your soil moisture, the water in the soil. And then I want to look at irrigation from the standpoint of design, approaches to irrigation, frequency of irrigation, and how that plays into soils. So you guys up for this? I think our panel, by the way, has 150 years of experience. Um, so we're, we're above Sebastian's panel. So, so I'm going to pose a series of questions um, and just see who wants to grab it first. And we'll go through a bunch of questions and then we'll pass it off to the audience. I want to seed ideas for you that, to get detail on the questions. So, so first off, when we look at soils, a big topic of interest right now is cover crop and how to utilize cover crops and do they actually help with irrigation? So. I'm going to throw that out there as a general topic. Anybody want to grab hold? Two Be mics. Be careful with that double mic. Yeah, system. two mics, like two phones, I reckon. Uh, one thing that I, I love about, um, you can see I'm riding the brand today, an almond board. Uh, almond board's done, you know, we've, we've farmed raisins, we've farmed cotton, alfalfa, uh, wine grapes. Almond Board has done the most amazing job of education. Uh, education actually is our best technology. You know, it's that knowledge transfer. So I think it's critical, the work that they've done. Um, I've been kind of a, a follower of uh, their technology. They've always supported what we've done. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful. So that's how I'll start. Um, as far as soil biology, our, our biggest problem, I mean, the, the three things, and we heard it, kind of today was the three things that a plant needs are light, doesn't have to be sunlight, the next one's water, but the one that everybody misses is oxygen, right? So soil is the barrier for uh, oxygen a lot of times, respiration. Um, when we start looking at that, um, infiltration rate kind of gives us the, you know, the indicator for infiltration, but soil crop, cover crops, 
where, where we struggle, and I think they struggle across every uh, farming playing field, is in compaction. Compactions, you know, what happens to us is that, you know, we'll go, uh, we'll end up with, uh, you know, in the springtime, we need to get our, our fungicides on, soils are wet, we'll run our, our tractors across, and we get more compaction. So once we started promoting, you know, uh, cover crops, uh, we first looked at our infiltration rate and compaction. But the other thing it had is that, you know, most of our fields are, are uh, sloped. Uh, they've got a, uh, we've lasered them. And so what happened before I had cover crops is all that water went to the back uh, about the end of the field and I had a problem with discharge. So I think one of the things that I see is that I'm able to capture that water. That root structure puts that water back in the soil. Uh, obviously all the biological activities that we get are critical, but I'm south of the rain curtain, which is Merced. I'm in Madera. We have 12 inches and all the way to Kern County, we get six inches. So we're already handicapped on the amount of water that we need. So any capture of water is critical for us. So we see cover crops as being a, a critical part. When we say cover crops, I'll be specific to annual, you know, um, that that is a critical part for our growing uh, strategy. I'm gonna play devil's advocate. Um, I, you know, I, I think that we're, we get at least half, if not more than half of the benefits of cover crops in the Sacramento Valley, especially because we have something called resident vegetation. So we, we keep weeds managed in our, in our row middles. And I think that we're getting a lot of those infiltration benefits uh, from that. If you have clover as part of that weed mix, you're getting some free nitrogen, um, and then you don't have those extra management steps necessarily required with cover crops. There certainly are, are big benefits to, to cover crops, but I think we're getting some of those benefits uh, when it comes to infiltration, especially so critical when we have these atmospheric rivers that you got to slow down that water as much as possible. Um, but, but I would say that we're getting a lot of those benefits for free. And just with the high cost of herbicides now, one consideration that Brad Hansen at UC Davis has been talking about is just reducing that, that weed-free herbicide strip in the tree row. Reduce that length to, to save yourself money, and that will also be good for infiltration. <clears throat> so I am from Wilbur Ellis, but I have nothing to do with pricing, okay? I'll, pr I'll promise you that. Um, so maybe I'll walk through just a kind of a real-life situation where we had to improve uh, infiltration with a cover crop, okay? This is not the norm these days, but Grower was dealing with very clean irrigation water. And over the past few years, we've been going the other direction, right? Water quality has gotten poorer and poorer as we've, uh, over the past few years. And so this grower had, you know, the soluble gyp, 250 pounds for a mill equivalent per acre foot, and still was not getting past this sealant layer that was about zero to four inches or so, which is common with, with ultra clean water. And we did the sampling, we sampled down zero to four inches we found all of our gypsum, right? We had about 60 mil equivalents of calcium, 60 mil equivalents of sulfate from the saturated paste within that top layer. So that's where all of our gypsum was. It wasn't getting anywhere though, wasn't, wasn't penetrating. So really, we are, the best tool that we had to improve that was to get through that sealant layer because five inches, six inches of rain in the winter time wasn't gonna do it. So we employed a cover crop uh, with uh, it, I, I, the mix, uh, I forget the mix, but it did have some, some radish, some stuff with some tap roots that was going to be able to get and break through that layer. And what we found was by incorporating two or three different tools that we have in our toolbox, we were able to overcome that problem. So I, I, I would maybe want to just encourage growers to utilize or look at the entire spectrum of tools we have. And we have a lot of tools these days. 
and and definitely reach out to your advisors and and consultants when it comes to this kind of stuff because maybe there's something that they see or have seen work with other folks that would really be able uh, that would really benefit your operation so I'm really good at bringing things back to the simple and I'll just say that with cover crops you know just think about it they they're going to put roots down in your soil there's no better thing for improving infiltration uh your option is to till and then you're just creating a hard pan layer these roots are going to go down there they're going to create pore space they're going to give you place to have chemical reactions they're going to give you place to store water and uh you know they use water uh they also shield your ground or shade your ground and uh you know there's some balance there uh, there's been some studies that show that in certain situations you can actually improve the water balance by having a cover crop uh, so yeah thumbs up for cover crops I think what's really important that uh, but that came out of this is it, you know, the, the north versus the south. We, you know, for us, most of our soils are are big alluvial, you know, uh, loam soils, right? On our west side, we've got more clay, uh, but in the North Valley, there's a there's a higher clay. So I think critical is what we've heard up to this point is that knowing your soils is absolutely critical and where you are site specifically, you know, as far as in that block, you know, and what you're doing. So I think that's really, really important. Uh, but one of the things that I heard Kurt mention as well is, is that the, you know, there's these soil principles and one of them is to keep cover on, right? And I think those are the, those foundational things that we just got to look at. And I, I would use um, Blake's comment to on cover crop, it depends. Um, where we are up here in the North State, we're fortunate that we get more winter rains than some parts of the state. And we've got adequate water supplies in most years. And we've got a little more flexibility than if we were in Kern County. And, and you know, when I have this conversation with a grower down south, that can be a much more challenging conversation. Do you want me to water my trees or water my cover crop? Um, so, so it's one of those things. It depends on where we're at depends on where we're at. So another, another topic around sticking in the soil side before we dig into the irrigation side is an area that you've probably, you've heard a lot from the ABC about, um, and you've heard a lot from UC, is the concept of whole orchard recycling. It's been a great success story um, for growers that have participated in it. And I just wanted to have the panel kind of breach this topic of whole orchard recycling and thoughts on that and, and if any experience around the concept of, of reincorporating our tree wood back into the orchard during redevelopment. Well, when uh, um, grinding uh, the, the soil, uh, taking re, what do you guys call it? Re, uh, uh, reincorporating the soil. I, I was a little apprehensive, you know, as far as what I saw to begin with. I thought when they first started the practice, I was like, it's going to tie up nitrogen, there's going to be a problem. Uh, but really what it did was it, it allowed those young trees to, to be aerated, right? Again, we get back to that oxygen side. And what I saw was, you know, the, the, the trees that had, had, had incorporated uh, that residue, uh, those orchards are just taken off. It's a great practice, and uh, again, it depends, but it, at the end of the day, it, it has worked really well in our country. I'm going to contrast whole orchard recycling first with, with putting on compost, which my colleague Roger Duncan has put on tons and tons of, of green yard waste compost and found zero agronomic benefit in Ammons in Stanislaus County. Just cannot find anything measurable in the tree after putting on tons of compost. And we have found the complete opposite story when it comes to whole orchard recycling. And Dr. Cindy Daly uh, this morning showed for every 1% increase in soil organic matter, 27,000 more gallons of water you can hold per acre and whole orchard recycling is the single best way I've seen to increase soil organic matter in Ammons. And then also we can see the difference with the pressure chamber, which of course I'm a huge, huge fan of, always talking about is the pressure chamber. 
but that's going to integrate your the what the tree is seeing both in terms of soil moisture throughout the root zone as well as the evaporative demand and we do see that uh, the the trees that are in areas where the the orchard has been reincorporated are less stressed than than the control trees in our uc studies <clears throat> So the thing with the whole orchard recycling, and correct me if I'm wrong, Luke, is the price is what? It's like six hundred dollars an acre? To a thousand. To a thousand? Right. Okay, so so we gotta get over that, you know. But if you're if you're in a situation where you're talking about, you know, tying up water, putting water into the soil profile, capturing your nutrients, having places for these things to go and bind, uh, you know, there's your financial balance. If it, if it's possible, it's it's certainly a good option for those types of things. It's going to improve your root structure, or sorry, the uh, the soil structure, which is what we're talking about. It's going to give you more places for the for the water and the and the nutrients to, to bind onto, just like we're talking about with cover crops. So yeah, uh, thumbs up for whole orchard recycling. Too. <laughs> I'm like the scorekeeper here. And then, you know, I think it's, there's the carrots and sticks when it comes to whole orchard recycling. So, you know, the elephant in the room is that ag burning is being just totally banned in the San Joaquin Valley versus it costs two bucks, you know, it's, it's just pennies per acre really in the Sacramento Valley still to get a burn permit. And so it's just a totally different reality. So, so far I've seen that really the CDFA Healthy Soils grants has been the one way where growers in the Sac Valley have been able to make whole orchard recycling, you know, pencil out versus in the San Joaquin, not only do you have the big stick of it not being allowed, but you have big bucks also from the air quality districts down there. Oh no. Yes, Blake. <laughs> a follow-up on Luke's comment about the compost. Um, I think Roger's, Roger's been looking at the final productivity of the tree, growth, all that. And if I remember right, it's a piece of dirt that really doesn't have infiltration problems. Do you have any experience with compost application on a piece of tight, silty ground in terms of benefiting infiltration. Now, now, obviously, we can't go incorporating things in the almond floor, but a cap of compost under a fan jet or over a drip hose. Comments? That's that's a great point. Like I mean, you know, I've, a lot of a lot of um, the stuff that I've learned, a lot of the things that I've learned is from you know, traveling. You know, I was a I was an irrigation engineer, owned my own drip company for 30 years. And uh, so I got to go to Israel, I got to go to South Africa and Australia. Australia happens to be my favorite spot. Uh, and one of the things that I saw there was what you just said was when they would cut that cover crop, they'd, they'd blow that uh, thatch up underneath the vine. We have a lot of things and a lot of ways of doing things, but you know, that is a compost method. Underneath that compost, you get lots of worms, you get, you know, it starts to open up the soils. So it is, you know, it's, it's an important part. Uh, I've never, I've never had, you know, I've, my soils are semi-tight. I've not put a lot of compost in. And one of the things that I'm gonna work on, because we have such high tree mortality and we need to get rid of almond trees in the South Valley, I'm, I'm starting to look at, um, um, oh, char you know, uh, taking my trees that, that have blown down or, you know, I'm, I'm bringing out of the orchard and I'm gonna make a char and see if that'll, you know, add to it. So um, there are things or tools, but you know, I haven't seen, it makes sense. Great, thank you, thank you. So, and one thing I, I wanna clarify, earlier I said almonds and I have to apologize to my North State growers and Luke brought me back down to earth when he said Ammon. So I traveled the state a lot, so I have to apologize for that. So, so um, well, I'm gonna jump around a little bit or we won't get through all our, our areas of interest. So I'm gonna move into the area of measurement and, and Matt and I've talked for years about how do you manage something that you don't measure? And when it comes to soils and this topic and irrigation, we're looking at measuring multiple things, not just irrigation, 
soil moisture, but also the soils and mapping the soils. And, and maybe we can look at both the mapping of soils and understanding soils that you're dealing with, and then um, how do we um, look at understanding what our soil moisture is. So um, that's a pretty broad topic. So, and, and Kurt's passing it off to Matt already. He hasn't even put his hand up yet, but, but you're fairly versed in that area, Matt. Yeah, I, again, I'll go back to mapping and the, the way that I think is a, you know, a classical, when we started in 1990 designing irrigation systems, there was plenty of water. Um, Y'all up here don't have to worry as much as we do in the south. Uh, but what happened to us is that, you know, we'd go out to a, a grower. He'd say, hey, just break this up. You know, I've got a 40-acre block. I just want to make one set, so all I have to do is irrigate it, right? And then, and then I spent a, a, a bit of time. It was four years at John Deere Technology, and I went to the Midwest. We bought a company that started doing yield mapping. So this company developed the process of how to yield monitor. I think that's one of our biggest problems here in California. If we had yield maps on almonds, we would be able to see what, what those yields look like versus you know, what we, we assume they are right now. So yield mapping was a really important part for me to understand the variability of the soil. Um, when I came back home, uh, when we first put our first orchard in, we verist or we used <laughs> electroconductivity to determine the variability of the soil, along with the web soil survey, which is a good tool. But then in that variability, we pulled core samples and then understood that through that horizon, that soil horizon, it varies, you know, and there's, and as that water moves through that infiltration, you know, if it goes to a sand, it goes all those things. So what happened to me was I saw designers who weren't farmers, they were just designing a dot to dot irrigation system. Basically, what they would do is they'd go out, they'd say, well, the guy's using a blue fan jet, he's used it everywhere else, we're just going to do that in this other soil not knowing the infiltration rate or anything like that. So it's really important to understand your soils first. So what we did then, I started looking at these blocks and I said, well, we're gonna design this 40 acres into you know, four tens. It's not that much more difficult, right? And so when we did that, it gave us the, the flexibility to do what we wanted. But in those sandy soils, what we saw in the Midwest was that is as long as corn was planted on four, eight, four inches, like a traditional corn seeder, that, that the corn actually wouldn't grow a full ear. But if we spaced it out to 12 inches, we got an ear of corn, right? We flipped that strategy at home and we saw on our sandy soils that those trees or those vines were smaller. So instead of doing a variable rate irrigation system where you adjust the hose or the size of the jet, all we did was we tightened the spaces in the, in the sand area. So we have a 22 by 18, and we'd bring it to a 16 foot spacing where the almonds are, or where the sand was. It's important though for us is that we use dual line drip. We couldn't have done that with a fan jet because then we'd had more fan jets in that 16 foot spacing, which would have thrown off our DEU, right? Distribution uniformity. DU is the most critical thing we do, but in a field that has a 50% variability of soil, it's hard to get a 90% DU, right? So with that flexibility of those tens, we were actually able to design irrigation systems that we could fit our, our irrigation strategy to. And I hope if I was pretty clear on that, but it's, it's a big process and a long time for us to develop that. Matt, that was just beautifully described. And I just want to hammer on this one more time is that we're always talking about DU. You got to improve your distribution uniformity across your block. But if you have a sand streak or you have very different soils, you're going to be doesn't matter what your DU is. There's still going to be water holding over here and the trees are going to be dry over here. So my main concern is that with the prices of almonds and walnuts right now that folks when they're putting in new orchards are probably not doing zone irrigation with highly variable soils to save money but that's a it's a 25-year investment 
And I think that those dollars are, are really well spent where you have that extreme variability in the field. You know, I think um, <clears throat> if you hear nothing else today, you know, this is probably one of the most important things. I think Bill said it in the first section uh, on his tape. He said, you know, we're all, we're all so trained to look up and we don't look down so much. And, you know, if you're not considering the variability in your soil, consider this, you know, uh, a clay soil will hold about, will intake about a quarter inch uh, of, of water in an hour. Uh, a loam soil will take in about an inch in an hour, and a sand will take about, what, four or five inches in an hour, you know. So if you don't know how that variability plays out across your orchard, you know, what are you doing, you know? So I don't, I don't have the practical experience yet to know how we can actually set up irrigation systems to, to, to apply to these things, and I understand that there are limitations there, but that, that is where we have got to go when we have these limited resources. You've got to know that variability in your orchard, and that's what we're talking about. <clears throat> Maybe I'll take and go up about 30,000 feet. Um, we, we design orchards and we break them up into blocks, right, or fields, because why? So we can manage them differently, right? So what we are doing when we map or, or leverage soil mapping, EC mapping, we are then breaking that field into a distinctly smaller piece that we can then manage differently if it, if it involves a variable rate amendment application. Uh, the pre-development side, it could, it could dictate where we dig our backhoe pits. It could dictate what kind of cover crop we, we implement. Uh, folks up in the, in the North Coast go so far as sizing emitters or potentially designing irrigation sets based on where that variability is. So really, if, we, if, if all we do is take a step back and we look at this thing from a, from a 30,000 foot perspective, what we're doing is breaking that field. We're just going a step further. We're breaking those fields up into smaller pieces that we can then manage uh, uh, more appropriately. And I think once once we look at those, you know, once we look at that that process, that infiltration rate, the one thing that we haven't talked about in a clay versus a sand, is that if I leave my irrigation system on in the sandy soil, um, I get two inches of penetration, right? The infiltration rate's two inches per hour, right? In a clay, it's a it's a, a half inch. So what happens in a clay soil when I run, uh, you know, a, a, a blue jet? I start to get a lot of puddling, I get all kinds of things, whereas if I was in a, a sandy soil, I might not see that, right? Or if I got compaction. So I think one of the disservices not only is, is set size the right thing, but it's also that emission device. A lot of times, you know, you've got designers, and I think what was brought up is how irrigation systems are sometimes sold, and I've got 30 years of experience, is it it's the lowest price that's chosen, right? It's not the highest DU or the best design. It's always that I, I saw my neighbor do this and that's what I want, right? So it's really important. The ITRC at San Luis came out with a bill of rights. It says, Here's, here are the criteria for good irrigation uh, design. And I think those are things that we really need to follow. It's those principles that are gonna make us more efficient and, and get us through this, these drier times. I, I, DUs are incredibly important, but taking it just a, a little step further is incorporating the DU into our application rates too and understanding how dis distribution uniformity impacts uh, uh, ETC, right? If, if we're using ETC to generate irrigation run times, and such. So uh, I, I, I guess I would just caution that is there is some actionable, there, there are actions we can take when we understand DU. We can use that information in developing our irrigation run times on a weekly basis, day-to-day -day basis, whatever that be. So DU is something that we can, we can uh, 
implement into our operations actually fairly seamlessly. If we're using things like ETC to make good irrigation decisions, then we can easily implement this layer of information and make an even better decision. So I would encourage growers to take, don't just measure the DU and then say, ah, it's pretty good. You know, incorporate it into your decision making and, and we, can, we can make even better irrigation decisions. I, I know what you're saying is is address the DU. Sure. Right. Okay. I mean, if you got distribution uniformity problems that can be addressed, you want to address them. You don't want to just accept them and plan for them. You know, if if you can get out there and you can see where these things are actually happening, if it's if it's a soil thing, I, sorry, I might just be assuming it's is if it's not a soil thing, you can address those if it's in your irrigation system. That's what I'm thinking about. Sorry, water guy. I'm thinking about the irrigation. If you got if you if you got the the you know you got an emitter putting out a jet like that and you got one that's just bubbling, you know that's something you can address. I was going to address this, you know, in, in the next thing, and I, I'm sorry, Tom, but it's really important. A good tie-in in the South Valley. What's happening to us in the last since 12? Our water tables have declined, right? So what the systems that were built originally don't don't perform the same. So when do most when do most farmers uh, irrigate? Off peak, from Friday to Monday, in our basin in Madera, right? The water table will drop 40 feet. The design in that set of bowls will, if that, if that pump is pumping 1,000 gallons on Friday afternoon, by Sunday, it'll be pumping 750, right? The DU has declined over that time, and an accumulation of that basically makes your system ununiform. So it's really critical that when you turn that pump on and you look at that flow, we use pressure gauges at the distal end of a, a, of a, a irrigation system and it says, hey, 20 pounds. If you measure that, it's a simple process. If you measure that at the beginning of the set, and at the end, you start to understand that process. But to put, to put DU in perspective, this is how it looks. If I've got a, a drip line that's got 20 trees on it, right? DU on the first, the first five trees is 10 apples, the second, five trees is eight, the second five trees is six, and the last five trees is four apples, right? Well, who cares? Well, four apples is what you got on 25% of that field, right? That's what DU does. And a shameless plug for DU, um, <laughs> we, we um, created a resource at the ABC that shows you define it. It's an old school slide rule calculator and it helps you calculate the financial impacts of poor DU. So you can start with a, wow, I want to have a DU of 0.95. What happens financially if, it, if I really have a 0.85? And this year with the cost of water and, and input costs, it's high. It's, it's, it's money worth fixing the problem of your poor DU from an irrigation delivery perspective. Um, one one um, response on the, des the design stuff, this is a conversation It's really important when you are developing a new orchard, sit down and ask these questions of your irrigation company that's designing your system. If they don't know this is important to you, they're gonna design the system around, I need so much water at max load, I've got so much water available, I'm gonna break this land up into equal blocks to utilize the amount of water I have available. They're not gonna look at soils. They're not going to look at that soil uniformity. They're gonna design a system as low cost as they can so they compete with their neighbor. So it's important that you bring this, raise this to them. So, um, so one last thing before we get into um, asking questions, I really wanted to look at the concept of frequency and duration around your irrigation sets. Because that's two things. I need to deliver three inches of water this week to my field. How do I do it? What's the right frequency and what's the um, runtime? And that really is tied to this soil question, right? So for me, frequency, you know, the, 
a lot of times people will use Pulse, and you know, the ITRC will say that in a Pulse application, our transpiration may be higher. So we have to be careful of that Pulse. We have to understand the infiltration rate of that soil. But, but as important, that 66-hour run that I just talked about, if I'm in a sandy soil that's got an infiltration rate of one inch per hour, and my active root zone starts at 12 inches, if I run it in, you know, that, that PG&E runs a 66 hour run, right? From, mon from Friday to Monday. I, I've just drove that, that water to 66 inches, theoretically, right? What we wanna do is match, and I think the question was asked over here is, you wanna match that infiltration rate with the hour of runtime that your emitters are putting out. So as, as your system emits, right? You watch that flow go through the soil, you'll need a measurement tool. And once you see what happens going down through that soil, you now know where your active root zone is, where that plant's taking that water up, that's the target, right? If you're putting nitrogen in, you ought to stop at that point, maybe when right before you get to that 12 inches, you put your fertilizer in, because nitrogen almost goes faster than water. So as you put nitrogen in water, it'll go through faster. So I see people run in the off-peak or 24-hour runs, and in some spots, 24 hours is the right amount of irrigation. But you want to know where your target is, right? Your infiltration rate. Where do I stop? Where do I put my, fil my, my fertilizer? And then where does it run down to? And that is critical. Certainly, your runtime is going to depend on, on soil texture and the application rate of, of your irrigation system. My only caution, especially with that note about uh, you know, a lot of folks just, you know, irrigate, you know, kind of the, the irrigation schedule, maybe PG&E off-peak, is that those, if you do have a longer set, Anytime you have ponding, I don't want to steal Greg Brown's thunder from, you know, for, for later today, but anytime you have ponding, your risk of phytophthora is all of a sudden present. So that would be my, my word of caution. <clears throat> I'll just take 10 seconds to actually repeat what they said in the last one, which is, you know, the, the normal uh, uh, school of thought is, you know, you want to get water down deep into your root zone. We have an effective root zone. Yes, that, that's where most of your water is up. Take, and you want to have a leaching fraction to keep salts out of the soil, maybe, if you're not uh, fertilizing. You know. But if you have limited water supplies like so many people do now, I don't think, and this is just one person's opinion, I don't think it's such a scary idea to think that you can just put some water closer to the surface, not just on the surface, because I forgot who it was in the last, in the last section that said, you know, that increases your evaporation. You got to think about that. But a more pulsed irrigation, keeping that water closer to the surface where most of the roots are, if you have limited water, that's not a bad thing. You got to make decisions. Times are hard. You got to make some changes and then you know, pick it up when you can. It's just my idea. So my, my past life, I, I ran around not too far from here at California Olive Ranch, and, and we were growing oil olives. No one really knew how to do it at the time, so we were kind of making it up as we went. And uh, when I was running around uh, flipping sets and, and trying to decide when to irrigate, I had two questions in my mind, right? And I think they were kind of alluded to. Uh, when do I turn the pump on, and how long do I run it for? Right, that, that, was, that consumed my brain. And of all the things that were mentioned, soil texture and everything else, but when I talk to growers about irrigation decisions and irrigation management, in my mind, there's, there's three distinct approaches, right? There's, a, there's an atmosphere-based approach, which is where we, can, we lev use things like evapotranspiration, crop evapotranspiration, uh, to get an understand of what water demand looks like. We can, we can use a plant-based approach that has really been picking up steam lately in the pressure chamber. I echo Luke's uh, 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 you know, optimism with the pressure chamber and how it, how it could be used in the future. But also a, a soil-based approach, which is, I, I think Jerome mentioned it, was capacitance-style uh, uh, probes and texture shows up in those probes as well. You know, if we're measuring volumetric water content, 
A clay soil has a much smaller swing between wilt point and field capacity on a percentage of volume basis than a sandy soil does. So uh, what I always try to encourage growers to do is, you know, if we use ETC, someone was talking, I think you mentioned uh, Excel spreadsheets, you know, we can, man, we can put a really nice irrigation schedule on an Excel sheet, right, if I'm just doing ETC calculations. But ETC is really good at, at uh, uh, telling me how long to run the pump for, right, to, to meet demand, right, but it is very poor at telling me when do I need to turn the pump on, and that's where the pressure chamber comes in. And that's where some of these other tools come in. I've talked with growers a number of times that had irrigated every 10 days. I do, I do 42 hours every 10 days. That's what my dad did. That's what I'm going to do. And, and what we did was when we started using things like a pressure chamber and ETC and really leveraging two of those three approaches, we found that the, the duration or the amount of water that was being supplied was appropriate. However, we needed to shorten that interval up uh, to reduce the amount of felt stress, the amount of stress by the trees, and yields went up uh, accordingly. So uh, again, maybe I'm, I'm, I like to just stick to 30,000 feet, but uh, you know, implementing these tools can, can really help answer most of these questions. <clears throat> It's a soils uh, conference, but he, he just said it, and so I'm just going to second it, and Luke will probably third it, and I think Matt will fourth it, is <laughs> with, like with, it, with, it, with ETC, you're absolutely right, man. You're, you, I mean, there's a lot of problems with ETC. You're trying to replace what we think the tree has probably used, and this is there's lots of things that go into that and lots of things that can change that, and the resolution is only as good as you know the soil and the way you're applying this stuff and whatever. And then the soil, checking it by soil, you know, there's a lot of things there too. There's a lot of disconnects that could happen. If you say your soil's got water, it doesn't necessarily always mean that the tree is going to be able to make use of that water where it is. So use the pressure chamber if you can. Some tree based method of figuring out when the tree needs water. Nothing is going to tell you. The soil is not going to tell you. The weather station is not going to tell you, as well as the tree is going to tell you when it needs water. It's hard. It takes time. It's expensive to buy one. Again, if we're making decisions and these are the decisions we need to make, there's another one for the pressure chamber. If you have it, it's just it's a it's a it's a way to check your truth between the soil and the ETC and the other methods that you're looking at. Kurt, you so well queued up that we have a pressure chamber training this afternoon uh, here at the Chico State Farm. So when this program concludes at two. Uh, we're going to have a variety trial. We have an Ammon variety trial that's funded by the Ammon board. Uh, it's a great partnership between UC and Chico State. And then also have a, a pressure chamber training uh, that's going to be at 215. You just go down the road until you hit Ammons. Sorry, Tom. No, no, no. Sorry. One last thing. So we heard, we heard one thing, which was, I'm, I'm doing it. We heard today the whole rot, right? Nitrogen. What happens when you got dual line drip and you run a 66 hour run on, on heavy soils? If you're measuring in canopy and out of canopy, you see the humidity in those orchards goes through the roof at 100 degrees, right? We don't see that usually. We, we go by the orchard, we see it. That may be our highest level of, pro, of, of pro, being most problematic for whole rot, right? Is, and again, we're just talking about frequency, so. So I'm going to let Michael keep me honest here. I think we got time for a couple of questions. Are we a question, Michael? Okay, a question. We covered a lot. Yes. Okay. So how to manage around multiple varieties? <clears throat> so so during the drought, it really became evident to me. I've got my my blocks split on a Monterey and a Nonpareil. Right? Nonpareils are bigger trees. They take more water. Bottom line is that when I irrigated my, <clears throat> especially in the drought, I irrigated my nonpareils like my Monterey's, my yield was reduced, right? When I got out of the drought, I saw an increase because I went back to giving those, those nonpareils, you know, another 10%. But my, my system is split so that I can do that. And that, that's how I would, I, I guess I would recommend. Yeah, so assuming in a scenario where you not have that split by 
just would be the question, how would we manage that? <laughs> I don't know. So if I'm understanding correctly, the, the irrigation set is, it, there's no flexibility there, right? It, it's one irrigation set, multiple varieties. Well, in that instance, I would probably farm the majority, right? I would base my decisions on the nonpareil and, and do manage out the rest as best you can. I don't know that I have a great answer for you other than you know, we need, we need to farm the majority. If we, if we have a por portion or a corner of a field that, that we focus on, guess what? The rest of the 95% is, is going to suffer. Typical plantings, what, 50 to 60% nonpareil. So that's where I would start and I would base my decisions on the nonpareil. Uh, potentially, you could use a, a pressure chamber in other varieties kind of on a one-off kind of, kind of deal. To, to get an understanding of where stress is related, as related to where the nonpareil are at, but I, I would operationally, I would be farming the nonpareil. I would just note that uh, in some work done by May Columber, a farm advisor in Fresno, um, I need to, to catch up with what her latest results are, but last time I looked in her Ammon board funded research, when she was irrigating by variety, um, it didn't actually make any difference in the end. And that's a situation where it's full water, it's not, not a drought scenario, and it's not a freeze damage scenario where you have massive potential differences in crop load. But just in, in her work, uh, as far as I saw, there was no, no yield differences based on on irrigating the different varieties separately. All right, I think we're at time. So I want to thank the panel. I think they were a great panel. And like I said, 150 years of experience. <laughs>